Let me begin by thanking the Observer Research Foundation for uh, inviting me to share uh, the platform with uh, a man as distinguished as Mr. Ramadurai. It's really a privilege uh, to be speaking on the same platform. Uh, because I've come to know him over the last few weeks, um, uh, because my institute, which is the only research institute of the Planning Commission, actually works very much in the area of skills. And um, he is, of course, the PM's uh, advisor on skills. <coughs> so we've had an opportunity to interact quite closely over the last few weeks. And I must say, over the last 24 hours that I've, I've read his book, uh, very rapidly, of course, I have been even more enthused about the prospect of working more closely with him over the next few, next uh, several months. I'll tell you that in a minute as to why. But let me address um, this big challenge that, uh, that the country faces in a few words first. Uh, the title of the 11th five-year plan, which is what we are in, the period that we are in currently, is towards faster and more inclusive growth. Um, <clears throat> we have certainly been growing very fast. There are some question marks about whether we, that growth has been inclusive or not, although I should tell you that uh, if any of you have seen within the last month or so a publication which uh, we led called the India Human Development Report 2011. Uh, I was the team leader of it. In fact, we come to the conclusion that there has been a lot of social inclusion that has gone along with growth. In other words, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, Muslims, the marginalized groups, are, are their social indicators are growing faster, are improving faster than for the rest of the country. But the challenge is huge, there's no question about it, particularly when you compare us to China. Um, Mr. Ramadurai rightly pointed out that the average age in China already is much higher than it is in India and in 2020 it will be even higher. But you know, China also has a huge advantage. Because in the first 30 years after their revolution, they made massive investments in the very two things that he spoke about. The education system, especially at the bottom of the pyramid, and secondly, their health system. As a result, they have a life expectancy which is well, well above ours. And they had um, <laughs> literacy rates of about 90 uh, about 15 to 20 years ago and we're, we're just at 75 so 75 percent so we've got a huge challenge if you're going to be competing with them and they are our competitor, competitors there's no question about that <clears throat> now what our advantage is, is he's, he's rightly pointed out is, is this demographic dividend that we have this young population and what the demographic dividend is the following. It is, it is essentially the following, that the share of the working population in the total population is increasing while the share of the non-working population, i.e. the dependent population, is falling. In other words, those who are below um, 14, the dependent, and those who are over 60 or 65, the dependent, that share is falling and will continue to fall and the share of the working age population is going to go on rising for the next 20, 25 years. That's the demographic dividend, supposedly. Because what is the implication of this demographic dividend? The implication is as follows. There is a higher proportion of people join the working age, or are in the working age, they have incomes, they save, and the savings rate in our economy has gone up dramatically. Dramatically, it is just mind-blowing how phenomenally the, the savings rate to GDP ratio has, has increased. It's gone from 23% of GDP in 2002-03 to just five to six years later in the last year before the financial crisis 2007-08, it went to 38% of GDP, 14 percentage point. And the investment rate accordingly increased from 24% of GDP to 38% of GDP. So if you're hearing, oh, we are growing at 8 9%, this is what is driving this growth. This high savings rate, which is converting into a in high investment rate, which is, con which is showing the growth rate. And this, the savings rate itself is driven by the dem demographic dividend. 
But this demographic dividend is with us only for another 20, 20 to 25 years. It's already been with us and it's been building up, but it's around only for another 20, 25 years. So the challenge that he laid out, especially when you compare us to where we are and com compared to China, is huge, it's monumental. <clears throat> Let me turn now, particularly, to, edu to the education challenge, and I'll say a few words about the health challenge. And I must say that, and I, at each point I will refer to his book, because I learned a lot from his book, especially from the last two, two to three chapters. And I became very excited as a result of learning those things, because my relative pessimism began to melt away. And I'll come back to that shortly. But first try and appreciate the challenge here. Um, we are a country still at 2011 data, 2011 census data. We are still a country of 74% literacy rate. In other words, 26% of our population is illiterate. The mean years of schooling of the, of the adult population, of, sort of those above seven, mean years of schooling is barely 4.6 years, while in China it's 6.7 years. 4.7 years of mean years of schooling means that the average person in the country has less than primary education. This has to change. Now how is this going to change? We've got, we've created the infrastructure. A lot of it, more needs to be created, especially in the, in the northern and eastern states that he rightly emphasized. The challenges, I believe, are twofold in quantitative terms, and, and there is one qualitative challenge in the education system. Let me first refer to the two quantitative challenges. You know, in his book he says there are 579 million people who are under 24 four year old. Now, most of these 579 million people should be attending school or college. <clears throat> so, and yet, he talked rightly about the very high um, dropout rate. And the dropout rate goes on increasing as you go from primary to upper primary to secondary to higher secondary to higher, higher education. So that dropout rate has to decline. The second big challenge, of course, is what I was, I was talking about earlier, that the mean years of schooling is extremely low, and you have 26% um, of the population which is illiterate, which, makes up, which, which means about 300 million people are illiterate. Actually, not the 200 million that his book says. Because now 300 million was the population of our country in 1947. Just remind yourself of this fact. So these are two huge, monumental, quantitative challenges. Now, <clears throat> let me sort of break this down, as he rightly did as well. How are we going to ensure that all the teachers that we need to, in, to meet the norms of the Right to Education Act? Because what does the Right to Education Act now, which passed in 2009, say? The Right to Education Act says that every um, school must have the primary school, I'm talking about the primary level, must have five classrooms, because there are five classes, five teachers. And the, the, the teacher to pupil ratio must be one teacher to 35 pupils. Our current reality is that there is one teacher to 47 students. On average in the country, and there are of course plenty of sc schools in UP and Bihar, in the rural areas, where it's 100. One is to 100. So you've got to hire at least half a million new teachers in rural areas. And our current problem in a large parts of our country, that particularly in rural areas, despite the fact that school teachers are paid very good salaries, far above the per capita income of our country, in fact, compared to other developing countries, relative to per capita income in other developing countries, our school teachers are paid much, much higher, much, much higher. I've done this estimate and it sort of comes to 13 compared to the African, next African higher uh, average of about seven or eight. In most develop, developed countries, it's that ratio is actually much less. 
Despite the fact that school teachers are paid high salaries, very good salaries, they don't turn up to teach. And their competence, their knowledge of the subject is extremely low. Now, one of the big challenge that, challenges that our school system faces, not just that we have to hire more teachers, but how are we going to improve their competence? Because if you, they don't have the competence, how are they going to ensure that these children are learning so that if they are learning, they will remain in school. If they don't learn, that's when the parents take them out. They say, kya faida hai? Bacha, the school mein kuch sikta to hai nahi. Why should we let them be? Let's send them to work. Huh? So, in other words, we've got to improve the quality of the teaching. Well, how are we going to improve the quality? And I found the book says something about this. And I found that very reassuring, actually. That, <clears throat> you know, throughout, of course, in the book, he talks about the TCS story, where TCS is always coming up with interesting, innovative, frugal solutions. And the frugal solution clearly, and I'm really hoping that in his role as the PM's advisor, skill, skill advisor, this role of using technology as a, as a solution in ensuring that our teachers in rural areas get trained properly in subject knowledge is realized. Because currently, the problem is the following. Not only does the government not allocate enough funds in the Sarvashiksha Abhiyan for school teacher training, our diets, our district institutes of education training, our block resource centers, our cluster resource centers, the BRCs, CRCs, they're not equipped to actually carry out this training on a regular basis. And the book talks about IT-based solutions and video-based solutions, which could enable this to happen on a large scale. And I'm so delighted about the possibility of this going to scale, because it worries me no end that you have a current situation where, despite being damn well paid, they don't turn up to teach. Their subject knowledge is not very good. So how are we going to ensure that this, the child actually learns? You know, the ISR studies, the Pratham, etc., they've all demonstrated over and over again the learning achievement is extremely low. How is that child going to learn? Now, I believe that the solutions that he's talking about in the book are extremely open. Let me turn to the, to the next level. This is particularly focusing on the age group, 6 to 14, which is what the focus of the Right to Education Act is. But let me now turn to this, the post-8, class 8, meaning to children who are post-14 years of age. And that's where we are all talking about, and he talked about, this clean break, this disruption, the clean break from the current educational system, wherein the children essentially drop out, primarily because they see not much employability resulting from just simply continuing in school. Their, their chances of getting better earnings as they move along to secondary level, class nine and so on, are not that much greater if you've just, <clears throat> compared to what, you, if, if you've just done class six, seven or eight. So the alternative that we are now offering th them through what we call the National Vocational Education Qualification Framework, which he and we are working on together, which the central government has accepted with the state governments, including the state government of Maharashtra, has accepted in principle, the Central Advisory Board on Edu Education has accepted. And what it is essentially saying is the following that the secondary school system in our country has had a, a rather weak vocational education system. There is also been run by the Ministry of Labor. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll finish in the next few minutes. <laughs> um, the Ministry of Labor is running an ITI system and very weak, not really skilling people. And what the NVQF is attempting to do is actually create a vocational education system whereby there would be industry involvement, there would be children will be able to sort of do multi-entry and multi-exit. In other words, they can leave the school system, join work, come back, because that's what children should be able to do because they are too, 
for those in the bottom at the bottom of the pyramid they don't have uh, the, the, the earnings to continue in, in schooling that is implies that the clean break involves LV a semester system a credit credit based system there will also be possibility of recognition of prior learning because there are so many skilled people for instance the neighborhood Hawaii who makes great rasgulla he should have some certification he should be able to get certification or the ikat maker or the amazing or the amazing buster craftsman all of these people i'm just giving you examples there should be there should be a, a system whereby there should be recognition of prior learning all of this is being provided for in the national vocational education qualification framework and the school and higher education system is is is, is supposed to be is supposed to be uh, re-equipped and and revamped with this with this objective. And again, I believe that there are ideas in his book which talk about how all the sort of teachers who we will need. Sorry, there's one other cra characteristic of the of the NVQF which you need to understand is that current vocational education system doesn't have any industry involvement. And the reason why children who go through the vocational stream in our school system don't get a job is because there's absolutely no industry involvement and that's provided for in the in the system. But I want to close by just, you know, in some ways perhaps challenging Sir Ramadurai to in, in his new role to begin thinking about how the challenge of finding the right kinds of teachers and training those right kinds of teachers for vocational education is going to be met through IT-based solutions. There are some incipient ideas about this in, that I've already talked about and already in the book, as I mentioned, through distance video and IT-based solutions. But with our next level of challenge in, in the secondary school system and skilling system, is how are we going to find the teachers to train those who need to be skilled. There are a lot of industry people but who don't have any pedagogical skills. So we want to ensure that industry gets involved in the teaching, in the design of the curricula, in the certification, in giving internships, but very important that because they currently don't have pedagogic skills. In ensuring pedagogic skills for them because we need the, the number of teachers that we will need or trainers that we will need or instructors in the variety of skills, the people who have to man Reliance Fresh or private security or media, you name it, the economy is diversifying constantly. Industry will provide these people but they don't have the pedagogic skills. And how can IT-based solutions in fact enable this rapid training of these large numbers of people who will actually provide this vocational education in this new disrupted, to use his word, education system is a challenge in a sense that I'm throwing to him. Thank you. I'd like to open it now for uh, questions. Uh, we have time for two questions. <laughs> yeah, I request the audience to identify themselves and where they're coming from, please, because uh, it's being recorded. Uh, uh, just wait for the mic to come to you. Uh, see, my name is Ashish Puntambikar and I work for the Nataraja Foundation. This is uh, two things I want to say which uh, haven't been mentioned by the speakers. Uh, first thing is that, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mehrotra mentioned that there's not enough, uh, you know, employability scale, therefore people drop out of school. There's a fundamental problem I have with that number. I'm actually project designer for two large projects. One is the Indian Education Mega Project, which, can, which will build 30,000 schools. And these are all secondary schools and I found a way to raise almost 6 lakh crores to raise this money without taking any money from government of India. 
The second uh, large project that I have developed is something called the Mumbai Mega Project, which rebuilds the entire city of Mumbai, and I know my subject extremely well. So I just want to say these two things. 46% of teachers in India haven't passed the, gone beyond class 12. That's the first thing. And people are, almost, there's a shortage of almost 4,92,789 schools, secondary schools. So children aren't dropping out, sir, there are no schools. So what I have done is I found a way to build almost 30,000 schools without taking any money from Government of India. There's a whole project here. And actually I sent it to the Planning Commission. For two years this has been sitting in the Planning Commission and nobody has done anything about it. <laughs> that's one thing. The second thing is, no, no, see okay. 500 million skilled people, that's we are going to generate. Now where are the projects to employ these people? You know, that is something that nobody has thought about. We need projects like the Manhattan Project here in India if you want to employ 500 million people, sir. That's no, all I, I think, want to say. Um, one is if you have got a great idea to do something without spending money, I will be the first guy to adopt it. That's number one. But it's sitting in the planning commission, you must have sent it to the wrong guy there or you must have sent it to the wrong ministry. So we'll see what can be done. But fundamentally, if it is a sound, innovative idea, which disrupts, it will certainly be a welcome one and there will be enough takers to look at it, let me assure you of that. Second thing is the shortage of teachers has been looked at very carefully because every state I visited on the ground starting from Assam right through to Kerala to the north, one of the clear things that came up was where are the teachers? If you go to your, um, where are the teachers and where are the teachers were qualified? And what are the number of colleges, the B.A. degrees, which are meaningful, which enables the teacher to teach? That is the second. But then we have to disrupt again a fundamental question. If I am able to teach or you are able to teach, I don't have a B.A. degree. If a child learns today along with another set of children using a pad, using a device, and then they discuss together and learn from there, there are examples where uh, even yesterday somebody was telling me a fifth grader, which means essentially 11 year old kid, uh, ch uh, child, is able to solve differential equations and calculus. And how she or he learnt it is by just the parent just telling them to look at the YouTube. From there they picked up. There's a YouTube uh, freeware available called Khan Academy. Every single course is available for each one of us to look at it. I myself do it and learn every day something new. So there are disruptions which you are talking about to go away from the teacher, the role of the teacher to be a mentor or a facilitator, and then looking at this problem. So I think please be rest assured, any disruption if you think you can monetize without sending too much of money, and I also said that use the existing infrastructure. Let's not spend on the existing infrastructure. If a school is going to take that much time to build, you're not going to be waiting on that. So I think you've got to look at multiple ways. So every new idea is uh, important. With regard to the demand side, that's the other thing which uh, Merotra very clearly articulated. The role of the sector skill councils and the role of the private sector and the corporates to look at the demand side. If you look at the power generation that's going to happen in this country, what is the kind of requirement starting from the lowest to the highest level? If you take a retail, which he also touched upon, what is the lowest to the highest level of skills that are required? So the demand side is going to be very clearly mapped and the uh, government is looking at what we call as a labor market information system, <coughs> which is going to be built for the country and essentially an exchange. These are going to take time, but number of small initiatives which are disrupting the formal form of education and skilling and where are the jobs? Everybody is not going to go to a Tata Consultancy Services. Everybody is not going to work in the corporate sector. And he also articulated how are our artisans, how do we find a market for them? What is the skill beyond what they have today to connect them to the market? These are some things. Now, as you said, 250,000 villages will, be, will have the broadband in two years. Now, there are total 5 lakh villages. What about the remaining 250,000? When they will have the broadband? I think it's the panchayats, I said, it's not the villages. So it's 250,000 panchayats. Uh, sir, uh, you talked of uh, disruptive uh, innovation and the use of technology. Uh, so one question which I have is that, uh, so one of the more, uh, one assumption. 
Yeah, uh, so I was talking about disruptive innovation. So one assumption uh, education rests on is that you need time off from work, right? So, uh, and you, so we have mobile phones and there's good amount of penetration of mobile phones. So can uh, technologies like M-learning be used to ensure that people learn while they don't need to be off from work? So employability is there, uh, while at the same time they, uh, they undergo certifications. Yeah, That's the answer is yes. There is a, I mean, I, I wouldn't deny that entirely. You have to do, keep this in mind that there are many phone users who are actually themselves illiterate. So, you know, that barrier also has to be broken because as we get, we are already at about 32% rural penetration of the, tele, of the mobile telephone and that's going to increase very rapidly. But, you know, a, a modicum of literacy has to be ensured and this is what I find exciting about his book because he yeah. talks about the total literacy, you see the government has had a total literacy campaign for a long time. Right. But there are, <coughs> there are methods that the TCS has worked on. I had no idea about this. Yeah. TCS has worked, methods that the TCS has worked on, they've thought very seriously about this. About how to ensure <laughs> literacy, you see, um, basic literacy to, to people for this 300 million people. And it's yeah. absolutely fantastic that you, the, you must read the book. I tell you, right. I was so excited. You really need to look at the, the kinds of solutions that he's talked about. Right. Uh, Can I just respond to that question about the uh, secondary school? There are no schools. Yes, that by and large is sort of true. But the situation is changing very rapidly. Since the beginning of the 11th five-year plan, we now have a Rashri Madhyamik Shiksha uh, Abhiyan. In other words, just as you have this uh, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, so the infrastructure is growing quite rapidly in the, in that, in the secondary school space. So, I mean, every effort for the, of the kind particularly that you're talking about is welcome and by and large the share of secondary, the share of private schools and secondary schools is high and is, 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 is not, doesn't show, seem to be declining. But, Quite clearly, if we are universalizing elementary education as we are rapidly seeming to do, then the transition to secondary is going to become a challenge, and you rightly point to the challenge. That's why there has been, since the beginning of this financial year, of this 11th plan and the Arashri Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan. Okay. Hi, this is Pital Walaya. Uh, so my question is that you mentioned that about of the 56 million global shortage of skilled workers, 47 million, there will be excess from India and therefore we will have an opportunity to tap that. Um, given what we have seen with respect to the protectionist tendencies in the developed world, how realistic is that possibility of us being able to tap those opportunities? Because if it involves sending our people overseas to do that, immigration has not proven to be the easiest of subjects uh, you know, in the history of the, uh, of the well, globe. I think, if you are going to go by the conventional method of mobility where everybody is to be put on a plane or a ship and taken there, that's not the model we are looking at at all. If in an IT industry I can do the work out of my location here in uh, Mumbai, then I extend it to working out of Pune. From Pune I can extend it to Nasik. From Nasik I can extend it to the next smallest town. We are taking the job where the people are rather than people coming to the job locations. That's a fundamental change. That's one. The other, I think you have to understand is that Europe and Japan are characterized by an absolute decline in numbers of total population and of course the working age, of working age. Absolute decline. I mean, so Germany has this situation where they're trying to incentivize births among German families. Now, they may be humming and hawing about this, the, that, that, that situation that you just described, today it's going to become more and more and more difficult as, you, as time goes on. I mean, and even where sort of activities require physical presence, for instance, think about farming in Germany, Italy, Spain, etc. You know, I used to live in Italy at the beginning of this past decade, about 10 years ago. I spent three years, every time I would come home and go back, the flight used to be full of these Punjabi farmers who were working out there in the boondogs in Tuscany and, and Siena, in the out beyond Siena and so on. So, you know, they are desperate. And they are, that desperation is going to go on increasing. 
Sudhir Badami. Uh, Dr. Maharotra, you mentioned about the Human Development Index uh, is showing signs of inclusiveness. Uh, I think you talked about inclusiveness in terms of communities and uh, what you call the religious basis. But I think uh, from the point of view of poverty, how inclusive is it? Um, good question. <clears throat> First, let me tell you what we found in our analysis of uh, state-wise human development index. What we found was that the poorest states had seen a faster improvement in the human development index than the rel relatively richer states. So interstate disparity in HDI was declining, point one. Point two, for, a, for the majority of indicators across health, education, um, <clears throat> unemployment rate, etc., we found that the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, Muslims, their indicators were improving faster and their indicators are converging with the national average. So, you know, the, the data is showing this. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the data is showing this. So, I mean, you can't question the data. However, so, so the conclusion we draw from this is the following, that there is with growth social inclusion happening. In other words, if the situation is rather different from what the Satchar committee was arguing on the basis of data running up to 2001. However, there is a serious warning that I would strike, which is the following. We've just done some analysis of employment trends over this past decade. And it is very grim and it is very worrying. And I say this particularly, sir, because I haven't managed to make a pre presentation on this subject to you, although we were making a presentation on another subject. We've done an analysis of 2009-10 National Sample Survey data and, of, and, comp and looked at the entire decade. And this is what we have to report. There was no increase in employment in services in the latter half of the decade. In the first half of the decade, there was an increase in employment in services from 94 million to 112 million. But in the latter half of the decade, it remained at 112 million. In the, what about manufacturing? You see, what is, the, what is structural transformation? Structural transformation for a developing economy is when we, people are moving out of agriculture into industry and services, right? That's what you would expect in a period of rapid economic growth. But I am saying services didn't see any increase in the latter half of the decade in the period of the fastest services growth in the country. Unprecedented. What about manufacturing? Again, manufacturing has seen output growth which is unprecedented in the, in, in the history of the country. In the latter half of the decade, manufacturing employment actually declined from 55 million to 48 million, a decline of 7, of seven million. In the first half of the decade, it had incidentally increased from 44 to 55, but it has declined. So it's very worrying. Where the increases in employment have taken place are all in construction, which is, which is uh, I mean, so that's where the workers have gone from agriculture. So I there is lack of inclusive growth in that sense. The last question. Yeah. I'm Avi Shanoi. I'm an engineer by profession. I don't know whether the policy is also addressing that, uh, you know, we need a paradigm change in the thinking of the parents also. Because right. today what is happening is it is the parents who are pushing our children into that, you know. They want everybody to become engineer and doctors, you know, as Mr. Ramadura has said. And uh, in fact, there was a boom in between about the MBAs. You know, there was a lot of colleges which were opened for MBAs. And now today we find the people, you know, the students who have become MBAs are doing the jobs which are very, you know, nothing related to MBA at all, you know. So I don't know whether the policy which you are thinking is addressing that, you know, that changing in the paradigm of the parents itself. No, I think uh, communication and advocacy to cover the parents is one of the critical elements and that has to be done and the National Skills Development Corporation is definitely looking at that. That's one of the most critical elements. I'm happy you pointed it out. Kavi, you wanted last question? Yeah. My name is Kavi Arya from IIT Bombay. He will also have the solution, that's why I said. <laughs> <laughs> I find many people have lots of solutions, but has anybody modeled what are the situations under which what promises to be a demographic dividend will turn into a… Di 
a demographic nightmare because we are working with legacy institutions which have not been able to do anything over the last half a century. Sure. What is the guarantee that these guys will be able to give us that exponential growth sure. that we are looking for? No, no, I think uh, that's why uh, if you saw, I kept on saying about disruption. The way we are looking at the future by purely extrapolating what is happening today where there are all failed institutions is just not going to work at all. Even amongst the ITIs, we did some study by physically going to there. The one in Aund is a world-class performance where every single graduate is getting a job in one of the automotive companies or uh, manufacturing companies, etc., or the retailers. Whereas there are some very close to that, where they are located in locations where there can be no job that is found, teachers are absent, curriculum is almost totally obsolete of irrelevance, this is they don't get a job at all or nobody wants to enroll there. Forget even about getting a job, they don't even want to enroll. The students are very smart. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to water. Oh, one la last question, okay. Uh, I am uh, Bandhubhattai <laughs> from Reliance. I, I started trying to write something on micro-level analysis of implement no, I think the only just, help you can just, give is just, Reliance Fresh should take a million people to be absorbed in jobs. No, just, just, just <laughs> one, one question. One question. First of all, first of all, we are talking of educating, you know, uh, literacy level 100 percent. But if we don't have enough job opportunity here, the brain drain will continue. Then at the end of the day, we should have an infrastructure, you know. Uh, so that uh, that will continue to benefit us as a dividend, you know that. Uh, so how will you ensure that? And how you are connecting our EYDAI in your uh, total uh, statistical data? Because unless our statistical data is very clear, then this figure, statistical figure, what we are talking, uh, what extent, you know, it carries, uh, we will concentrate on the cities, uh, uh, you know, this. Uh, that is very important because statistical data, unless we have got a very clear and very focused uh, data from everywhere, every corner. Then our uh, work may not you know, reach to the uh, village. So these two questions, uh, I'm very, uh, this one, because all work cannot be done from sitting in India or overseas market, physical presence. And once our brain dens are there, then our country will not have anything infrastructure. That is at the end of the day, we need it. I think, I think all this yeah. linkage to UIDA and all mm -hmm. are for the future. First, let's get the UIDA running and create the uh, identification and the registration of people. That's what is happening today. So to just put the horse before the cart is not a valid uh, thing. We will keep it at the back of our mind. We don't want to confuse by adding so many things and so many layers, nothing happens. Today it's a very simple, and if you see, and the only way to see it is by going and living in a rural area. And even if each one of us spend even five days in a rural area, you'll find solutions how to connect with those kids. That's what is needed today. Just to give a simple tutorial on something which you know, which they are hungry for. On the infrastructure, what I can tell you is that there's the increase in investment in infrastructure is what's caused this massive increase in employment in construction. Because in uh, construction employment in 1999-2000 was about 17 million in the whole country. It's already gone to 52 million. In other words, a 30, 35, nearly 35 million increase <clears throat> over this decade. And most of that, a very significant part of that increase in employment is in organized uh, organized uh, construction rather than uh, unorganized. And this has happened because investment in infrastructure went from four, four, four and a half percent of GDP at the beginning of the first 11th five-year plan to some seven and a half percent of GDP in this final year of the 11th five-year plan. It, it is about 350, 400 billion dollars in this period. The plan in the 12th five-year plan is to increase investment to a trillion dollars, uh, take it up to some nine to ten percent of GDP. So you're absolutely right. Not only will infrastructure investment increase and the share of private sector in, in infrastructure will increase, but sort of employment in it will go on increasing.
All right, I think we're done with all the questions. Thank you so much for coming to Observer Research Foundation today. I would like to thank Mr. Ramadurai and Mr. Santosh Mehratra for taking time out of their really busy schedules uh, to come here and give us this interesting dialogue on uh, skill development. I uh, hope to see you again in our future ORF events. Thank you. Thank you.